Okay, you can go for it. Thank you. Okay, I even heard it. recording in progress. Um, I've got to click. Uh, got it. Um, so anyway, the the aspects of this work that involve composition operators are joint with Derek Thompson, a student of Carl Cowens, um, and at the very end, I'll be talking about some general issues, products, and powers of posinormal operators, and that's joint with Carlos Cabrushley, uh, Trela, and Derek Thompson. Um, in early December of last year, Derek Thompson uh, sent me an email message proposing that we try to characterize posinormal composition operators on the Hardy space. At the time, I didn't know the definition of posinormal operator, but after I learned the definition, I thought that characterizing posinormality for composition operators with linear fractional symbol on the Hardy space would prove to be interesting. And it did prove to be, and I'd like to share that story with you today. I'll start with a few definitions and notation. Um, my first goal will be to introduce my favorite characterization of posinormal operators. So let me see if I can get my slides to advance. Um, there we go. Um, so H is a complex Hilbert space like little L2, um, BH collection of bounded linear operators on H. Um, here's the definition of adjoint. And if you think about it for a moment, by definition, uh, we know that the perp of the range of T um, is certainly going to be the kernel of T star. Take the perps of both sides, the perp or the kernel of T star is the closure of the range of T. And so in general, if you have a Hilbert space operator, uh, the perp of its kernel will be the closure of the range of its adjoint, a basic fact that I'll be using a lot during the talk. Here's the well-known definition of normal operator, one that commutes with its adjoint. Um, corresponding uh, norm equivalence over here. Um, so in the linear algebra world, normal operators, of course, are those that are unitarily equivalent to diagonal operators. In the operator theory world, those are unitarily equivalent to multiplication operators on L2 spaces. Um, here's the definition of hypernormal operators. So T is hypernormal if uh, T star T minus T T star is a positive operator. Um, got an equivalent norm characterization. Um, if you restrict a normal operator to one of its invariant subspaces, you get a hypernormal operator called a subnormal operator. And my favorite example of a hypernormal operator that's not subnormal is twice the unilateral shift on L2 plus its adjoint, the backward shift. Um, this is certainly not subnormal. In fact, the square of this hypernormal operator is not even hypernormal. Um, I'd like to prove a basic fact about normal operators. So if n is normal, um, its range is the same as the range of its adjoint. Um, so what I'll prove is that if n is normal, its range is contained in the range of its adjoint. Of course, since uh, n star will also be normal, this proves the proposition. Um, so let's get to work on this. The range of n is the direct image of h under n. And now let's look at h differently. It's the kernel of n plus uh, direct sum, uh, the perp of the kernel, which is the closure of the range of its adjoint. Um, and so I've proved here that the range of n is the direct image of the closure of the range of n star under n. And let's suppose the range of n star happens to be closed. So maybe we're working in finite dimensions. So I'll continue arguing with that assumption. And so the range of n is the direct image of the range of n star under n. And now by definition, that's the range of n n star. And we're talking about a normal operator. So that's the range of n star n. And then obviously the range of n star n is contained in the range of n star. So there's a proof of the proposition with the assumption that the range of um, uh, n star is closed, which is equivalent to range of n being closed. But let's prove this in general. Let's take an arbitrary element and the closure of the range of n star. And so I can take a sequence, uh, little h n and capital H um, converging. Um, so that's the n star. I've got to move pictures out of the way. n star h n converges to h. Um, well, since n star h n is convergent, it's Cauchy. Um, and, okay, and so that's going to make uh, NHN Cauchy as well because of the, the norm equivalence. That's straightforward because N is normal. 
And so uh, NHN converges to some element V in our Hilbert space H. And let's uh, now finish the proof. And so this NH um, represents an arbitrary element uh, in the range of N. And by a continuity of N, that's this limit because N star HN goes to H. And now we've got a normal operator. Uh, and now NHN goes to V. So I just proved an arbitrary element in the range of N is actually in the range of N star. So I claim I've proved that inclusion. Um, so this inclusion is what um, you know, makes me like this characterization of posi-normal operator more than any other. It's simply an operator whose range is contained in the range of its adjoint. And so I thought this would be an interesting question to consider for composition operators uh, with linear fractional symbol. Um, one reason I like linear fractional symbols is that there's a nice formula for the range of composition operators um, or for the, for the adjoint of a composition operator with linear fractional symbol. Um, and the coposinormal just means that the, the range of the adjoint is contained in the range. So if an operator is both posinormal and coposinormal, it shares with normal operators the property that its range is the same with its range of its adjoint. Um, so the defect in this possible definition is that where does the posi come from? And that there's no posi normal, what is this? So let me go ahead and, and talk about the standard uh, definition of posi normal. Here's a preliminary definition of uh, what Rayleigh called the interrupter of an operator T. Uh, so P is an interrupter of T provided the equation here on the, the right holds. And if P is an interrupter of T, it's worth noting that P has to be positive on the range of T. Um, so here's the, you know, the inner product we wanna check for positivity, use the definition of adjoint to get this equality. Um, and then uh, for assuming it's an interrupter, then this product is this product. Again, use the definition of adjoint and yeah, we're done. We've shown that P is positive on the range of T. And so here's Rayleigh's definition of posi-normal operator is posi-normal if there's a positive operator in the whole Hilbert space so that uh, this equation holds. So you can see if we let like P be the identity, posi-normal, um, with P being the identity, you can see that a normal operator is, is posi-normal. There is an equivalent norm characterization for posi-normality, which I will uh, prove um, holds in just a moment, but first a little bit of history. Um, this notion of posi-normality was introduced in a 1994 paper um, by H. Crawford Rayleigh. Um, and uh, some people at the, the talk here certainly know of him. He's a UVA grad, student of Tom Kreitz. And Tom, are you there? I'm here. In fact, I, um, I, when I saw this notice, I uh, tried to um, contact Crawford and I did get his phone number, but I couldn't reach him but I got his email address and I sent him the Zoom link and I told him this is probably gonna be recorded, so. <laughs> cool, yes. Do you have any fun facts about Crawford? Uh, Crawford was my, I think, second student. He's a really nice guy. Uh, he was a, a, a real uh, part of the department. And uh, let's see, it seems to me he uh, and Nat Martin were instrumental in putting together an annual Patsy Cline party. <laughs> oh my goodness, that, that is a fun fact. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so anyway, we've got this nice UVA connection here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and prove this norm characterization of uh, posi-normality. Um, so I've got the definition here, uh, the alternative characterization involving norm. So let's suppose that T is posi-normal so we've got this equation holding where P is assumed to be positive on the entire Hilbert space. I want to show you that this is going to be valid. Um, so let's get to work on that. So, um, so there's my assumption. Um, this is something we've already talked about. I'm just grabbing the equalities I use to show P is posi-normal on the range of T, but now I, P is positive on the range of T, but actually we're assuming now P is an operator, positive operator on all of H. So let's grab the ends of this any 
uh, this equality. And so we know this holds, assuming that um, T is posi-normal with interrupter P. Um, and now let's just uh, flow with this. P is positive on the Hilbert space. It has a positive square root. Um, uh, apply the adjoint, move the one of the roots to the right-hand side. Um, and now I've got the norm of root P, TH squared. And um, let's uh, use operator norm. I use the definition of uh, norm in a Hilbert space there. Here's the operator norm. Um, so now if I take the square root of what's on the far left and what's on the far right, I have established that if P is posi-normal, if T is posi-normal, um, this inequality holds with R uh, being the uh, norm of the root of P. And now I want to convince you that R is bigger than equal to one if, if T is not the zero operator, and that's going to be easy. So I've already established that this, this inequality holds. Now assume that H is in the unit ball of capital H, that little H is unit ball, closed unit ball. Um, that's going to give me this inequality by definition of operator norm. And now I'm going to just take the soup uh, of this side over all H in the closed unit ball and get the, the operator norm squared of, of T star. Um, and I've proved this inequality holds. And so since the norm of T star is the same as norm of T, if T is not the zero operator, I can divide by the norm of T and, and get that um, R is bigger than equal to one. So that uh, if T is positive normal, we have this norm condition. The other direction is, is interesting uh, as well, maybe even more interesting. Suppose this norm condition holds. Um, let's define uh, a linear map on the range of T um, by this equation, um, S. I want S of TH to be uh, T star H. It turns out that this is well-defined. It's well-defined basically because the normal inequality tells us something in the kernel of T is in the kernel of, of T star. So you can check that. Um, it's also this S is also bounded on the range of T sort of by construction. Um, basically R is a bound um, and um, that's gonna allow us to extend this S operator to the closure of the range. Um, and then we can find S to be uh, zero say on the perp of the closure, the perp of the range. And I've constructed this operator S so that um, by construction, T star is equal to uh, TS um, on H. And if I take the um, adjoint of that equation, come on. Um, I'm now ready to check that the norm condition holding will give us uh, posi-normality. So I wanna check the positive normality uh, equation, basically, um, T, T star, what is that? I now can substitute for T and T star using uh, the equalities I just uh, wrote down. And so um, make the substitution and I've got it, right? T star um, P, T, where P is certainly positive because it's S star S. Um, any thoughts, any comments? So what I've done is basically prove most of this theorem of Rayleigh's that uh, uh, appeared in his uh, 1994 paper. Um, I've shown the equivalence of one and two. Um, the equivalence of two and three is simple, just you know, write out what the norms mean in terms of inner products. Um, let's see, what else have I done? Um, I've shown that two uh, implies four um, I had T equals T star S star. So S star is playing the role of C here. Um, also, uh, basically we just saw how if this equation holds, um, T is posi-normal. So I showed four implies one. And um, uh, certainly it's true that four implies five, right? If, if T is T stars times some operator, um, then clearly the range of T is contained in the range of T star. So the only thing that's missing is uh, four implies five, or five implies four. And I'll, I'll talk about that proof in a minute. But first, um, it's clear from my favorite characterization of posi-normal operator 
that if the uh, operator T is surject T star is surjective. If T star is surjective, then uh, T is certainly uh, posi-normal. Um, so what makes T star surjective in terms of T? Well, having T be uh, bounded below one to one with closed range. So um, invertible operators are automatically posi-normal. Uh, again, anything with uh, surjective adjoint, any operator surjective adjoint is going to be uh, posi-normal. What about uh, five implies four? Um, that's a corollary of this theorem due to Ron Douglas. Um, so uh, he showed that if the range of one Hilbert space operators contain the range of another, um, that's number one. Uh, then you have this nice relationship uh, equation relating the operators. Um, we've got that, it's easy to apply. You can let uh, T be A, T star be B, and we're done. Um, so this theorem appeared in a 1966 paper uh, by Douglas. Um, the proof that one implies three is very pretty and very simple. Um, so if we assume that the range of A is contained in the range of B, uh, then given any sort of little h and capital H, um, I've got this element in the range of A, it has to be in the range of B, so there's some y, so this equation holds. If you choose y to be in the, the perp or the kernel, um, then y is uniquely determined. I've got this well-defined mapping C um, and it's linear and you can prove it's continuous using the closed graph theorem. So it's a very uh, nice, uh, simple argument. Um, I think now I wanna point out that uh, posi-normality is a unitary invariant. In fact, uh, it's sort of, invariant under an isometry. Um, and this is uh, straight, straightforward. I don't really wanna make any comments about it. It's a unitary invariant. Um, it's not similarity invariant. And this actually has an interesting role to play. Um, so here's a simple matrix-based example. Uh, I've got this normal operator in, in fact, it's self-adjoint. Here's an invertible operator, it's posi-normal. Um, but here's a, an operator M on C2 uh, which is certainly not posi-normal because the, the range of M is the span of vector one, one, but the range of M star, the, take the conjugate transpose in the matrix, uh, the range will just be the span of one, zero. And so we certainly don't have the range of this matrix operator uh, contained in the range of its adjoint, nor do we have the range of the adjoint contained in the range of the operator. So M is neither posi-normal nor co-posi-normal, but you can do the calculation. It's actually similar to a normal operator. Um, so we certainly don't have uh, posi-normality as a similarity invariant. Uh, for later reference, I'll point out that products of posi-normal operators don't have to be posi-normal. They've got a product of two normal operators, uh, which is certainly uh, over here on the right-hand side. It's certainly not. Um, uh, posi-normal because the uh, range of that operator is the span of one zero, take the adjoint, the range will be the span of zero one if we don't have posi-normality. I will point out though that uh, powers of posi-normal matrices do remain posi-normal. Um, so the general fact is that if a, a posi-normal operator has closed range, um, then its powers will turn out to be uh, posi-normal, and that's certainly automatic in the finite dimensional setting. Okay, um, I think the next thing I'd like to do is quickly characterize posi-normal weighted shifts. Why not? I mean, that's sort of the first class of operators that uh, one would want to experiment with, with a, a new notion like posi-normality, but it's not new. That's been around since 1994. So let's uh, look at uh, characterizing um, weighted shifts that are uh, posi-normal. So little l2, the collection of all square summable sequences of complex numbers. I've got the inner product here defined, which is a natural generalization of that on Cn. Uh, let's let uh, Ej um, be the natural basis of little l2, so that uh, any um, sequence in l2 has this Fourier expansion. And now let's uh, take a, a sequence, uh, Wn, a bounded sequence of complex numbers. That'll be my weight sequence for the weighted shift W, um, which is shifting over our 
um, natural basis elements, uh, one slot with a weight Wj. And this is how uh, W is acting in general on elements of little l2. And it's easy to see that M is actually a norm of this operator on little l2. And I want to characterize the injective weighted shifts, so none of the weights being zero, characterize those that are posi-normal using the norm characterization of posi-normality that's here in, in magenta. Um, so I need to know what W star is, but it's easy to see that's the backward weighted shift um, acting this way on our um, basis elements. And now let's just see what the norm characterization says when I replace T with W and just look at this action on our natural basis. Um, so um, we know if W is posi-normal, this is certainly true for all J bigger than or equal to zero. I'll use our definitions of W and W star. Um, we can move the scalars outside with absolute values. The norms, of course, of the basis elements are one. Um, and now if I assume all the weights are non-zero, I get a necessary condition for posi-normality for a weighted shift. And it's easy to show this is also sufficient. And so I have established this uh, characterization of posi-normality for injective um, weighted shifts. Um, a couple of comments here. Um, let's see, we will be in trouble um, if a zero weight follows a non-zero weight. And so if you have a weighted shift, which that's true, it's not going to be posi-normal. If you have a weight sequence that decreases too fast, then you're not going to be posi-normal, like Wj is 1 over j factorial or something like that. Um, if the weight sequence is increasing then in, in modulus, then the limits will exist, and that soup's going to be 1. Um, R is going to be one. And so if R is one, then we're looking at a hypernormal operator. And so um, the hypernormal weighted shifts are those with increasing uh, weight sequences as well, you know, as well, certainly well known. Um, so let's turn our attention now to composition operators, and that's, you know, which I love. Um, so uh, let's talk a bit about the Hardy space, uh, H2. Um, collection all holomorphic functions on the disk whose Maclaurin coefficients are square summable. Um, and our product uses Maclaurin coefficients. And so we've got this obvious isomorphism going on between the Hardy space and little l2. We take a Hardy space function um, to its sequence of Maclaurin coefficients to get that isomorphism. Um, a couple of special inner products I'll be making use of. Uh, take an arbitrary Hardy space function, inner product with a constant function one. You're going to grab the zeroth Maclaurin coefficient. You're going to grab f of zero. Um, similarly, if you take f inner product, uh, the identity function z goes to z, you're going to get f prime of zero. And so I'll be using that a bit uh, in a bit. Um, what are examples? Some examples of H2 functions, polynomials, bounded analytic functions. Uh, this log function is a nice example of an unbounded Hardy space function. And then I've got a very important class of Hardy space functions. These are the reproducing kernels for the Hardy space. Um, let me go ahead and establish that fact. So take a, a P and the open disk. Um, then this function uh, KP um, has that Maclaurin expansion. And if we take the inner product of any old Hardy space function with uh, Kp, we multiply the Maclaurin coefficients together with bars on the, those of the second function, and I get f of p. So simple enough, this is the reproducing kernel for the Hardy space at p. Um, let's talk about composition operators. Um, so let phi be a, a arbitrary analytic function uh, on the disk that takes the disk into itself. I'll call it an analytic self map of D. Um, let's uh, look at a few examples of these self maps. Here are the images of the disk under these. Um, notice that the image of this self map, this linear fractional self map of the disk is the whole disk. Um, this is a one-to-one -one onto mapping from the disk to itself. It's an automorphism of the disk. This is actually self-inverse, V2 composes itself is, is the identity. 
if you put a unimodular constant out in front, you wind up characterizing the form of all such automorphisms. Um, so we can easily define an, uh, a linear mapping from the collection of all homomorphic functions on the disk to the set of holomorphic functions on the disk by decomposing with phi, that's the chain rule in, in action. Um, Littlewood proved in 1925 that um, C phi restricts to be a bounded linear operator on the Hardy space. And since the mid 60s, uh, mathematicians have been investigating um, how the um, operator theoretic properties of C phi tie into the function theoretic properties of its symbol phi. Um, the fixed point properties of phi play a, a big role in determining the operator theoretic properties of C phi, such as compactness, spectrum, cyclicity, and posi-normality. So let's take a look at the fixed point properties of phi characterized by the donshaw wolf theorem. And I'll just ask you to read this theorem. The Donjo Wolf point is this attractive fixed point in the closed unit disk. If um, the Donjo Wolf point is on the boundary, then you should interpret um, phi, phi is only defined uh, initially just on the inside of the disk. Um, so on the boundary, it means that the it's phi of W represents a phi of omega represents the radial limit of phi at omega. Um, any Hardy space functions uh, will have radial limits at almost all points on the unit circle. Um, so the Dinosaur Wolf point, it happens to be on the boundary. We know the radial limit exists there and it will be the same as the value of the function there. So I defined it be the radial limit. Also, um, if you uh, um, are on the boundary, you can interpret the derivative at that boundary point as the radial limit of the derivative function um, as uh, you move out to W along the, the radius um, that ends at W, the radius that begins at the origin and ends at W. This is the so-called angular derivative of, of phi at W on the boundary. Um, and I'll be using the terminal, some terminology associated with fixed point location and behavior. So maybe you can read that as well. Questions or comments? So I'm going to um, characterize uh, the normal composition operators on the Hardy space. Um, there's not a lot of diversity in the normality story, but I'm gonna tell that story completely here and reproducing kernels are going to help me um, with that. So here's our uh, um, definition, a reproducing kernel uh, at P over here. And let me show you how adjoint composition operators interact with reproducing kernels in a very simple and pleasant way. Uh, the, an adjoint composition operator will take a reproducing kernel to a reproducing kernel by this formula. And this is really uh, quite pleasant to show take an arbitrary function in the Hardy space. Um, let's look at uh, what C phi star KP uh, inner product F is. Uh, use the definition of adjoint, um, then use the definition of C phi and the reproducing kernel property, and we're there. It's very, very simple. Um, the action of an adjoint composition operator on a general element of the Hardy space uh, can be really tough to understand. Um, but if the symbol phi happens to be a uh, linear fractional, <clears throat> there's this formula for the adjoint composition operator due to Carl Cowan, which is, is very useful and when you're studying linear fractional composition operators. So if phi happens to be, the self map happens to be linear fractional, then the adjoint is a multiplication operator on H2 um, times the composition operator 
with this symbol. So this associated map, which I'll call the adjoint of C, this will also be a self map of the disk. And um, the adjoint turns out to be multiplication operator times that composition operator times an adjoint multiplication operator. And the symbols of these multiplication and composition operators have the formulas uh, given here. Um, and again, I'll call this sigma the adjoint of phi. So any linear fractional self map will have a adjoint self map uh, sigma. All right, so here's a lemma in my characterization uh, of normal composition operators. So um, if you are hypernormal, in particular normal, then the symbol has to vanish at the origin. Um, Derek Thompson and I uh, showed that if C phi is posi-normal, it doesn't have to vanish at the origin, but phi has to vanish someplace in the disk, provided phi is linear fractional. Some additional hypothesis is needed here. It's not the case that in general, C phi posi-normal is going to tell us that the symbol has to vanish at a point in the disk. An example would be uh, composition with a singular inner function. Uh, composition uh, phi is singular inner, it's bounded below. So the, the adjoint is, is surjective. So if, if phi is singular inner, um, this is posi-normal, but the, the symbol won't vanish. But for a linear fractional map, the symbol will vanish. A sufficient condition to get the central symbol will vanish is, is, is density of the range of C phi. Um, anyway, let's get back to work characterizing um, uh, normality. Um, I'll prove this proposition. It's very pleasant to prove. Um, so for any self-map phi, um, if we look at C phi star of one, um, you can view one as a reproducing kernel at zero, either using the formula or just uh, directly. You can see it. We talked about that earlier. And now let's use the proposition. This is norm of k phi of zero squared. Um, and so by definition, inner product of k phi is here with itself, use the reproducing property. And we know what the norm of C phi star of one is. Um, if um, we have a hypernormal composition operator, then um, we would know that um, the norm of our operator applied to one is greater than or equal to the norm of the adjoint applied to one. Um, so, Composition of the constant function one with phi just gives the constant function one. So if, uh, if, if C phi is hypernormal, this inequality must hold. And so that's only going to hold, of course, if, if phi of zero is zero. So I proved this proposition uh, for our hypernormal uh, composition operators. And now let's talk about normal composition operators. <clears throat> so again, there's not much uh, diversity in this story. Um, the normal composition operators are diagonal. Um, and let me just prove that. Um, I'm claiming that normal composition operators have to have symbol having a simple form. Uh, one direction is very easy. Um, if uh, the symbol is alpha z, uh, then the adjoint composition operator would be another composition operator, symbol alpha bar z. I guess we could use Cowan's formula. But this is, uh, if you think about this sort of matricially, this infinite matrix here, this is, is clear. And there are many different ways to see it's clear. But then um, it, it's clear that the adjoint operator commutes with the original operator. Um, the other direction is, is more interesting. Um, if you suppose C phi is normal, we already know that phi vanishes at uh, the origin. So I'm making some progress. But we also know, if it's normal, that we have this norm e equality for uh, the, the function f of z is, is z. And the rest of the argument is simply, the, you know, basically calculating these two norms will give us uh, the, that phi of z is alpha z. So let's see how that works. So uh, the norm of uh, c phi applied to z is just the norm of phi, which is the sum of the squares of Maclaurin coefficients. Uh, what about the norm of C phi star of Z? Well, first let's uh, come up with this uh, uh, fact that C phi star of Z is C prime of zero Z. Um, let's use the uh, definition. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with this inner product where F is generic Hardy space function, use the definition of adjoint. 
And remember, we talked about how Hardy space function inner product Z is just the derivative of that function at zero. I'm grabbing the sort of the Maclaurin coefficient of Z, um, but I'm assuming now, I can assume now that uh, phi of zero is zero. And so what's that? If you think about it for a moment, it's just uh, F inner product um, conjugate of phi prime of zero Z. So I've proved what I wanted to prove. And so what about the norm of this thing on the right? Well, it's just gonna be absolute value of phi prime of zero squared. And so if we write out what this means, uh, the norm on the left um, equals the norm on the right gives us this equality. But this is the first Maclaurin coefficient. And so the only way that infinite sum could actually be it's uh, n equals one uh, element is to have all Maclaurin coefficients be zero other than uh, the first one, the coefficient of z. And so we're done. Um, v has to have this form if uh, c phi is normal. So basically, uh, what if you look at the argument on the preceding slide, and this argument is basically saying that if, if c phi commutes with this adjoint applied to one, the constant function one, and applied to the function z, that's going to make it normal on the whole space. Um, so it's just sort of a fun fact. Um, there's not much diversity in the hypernormality story for composition operators on the Hardy space uh, if we restrict a linear fractional symbol. So uh, Cal Carl Cowan proved this characterization of hypernormal um, composition operators. So hypernormality means either normal or the symbol has this form. So a symbol of this form fixes the origin, but also fixes the point on the boundary. Um, so that's, that's it for the hypernormality story. Um, so the hypernormality story is, again, not that much diversity, uh, normality story even less, but there's a lot of diversity in the uh, uh, posi-normality story. And I'll let you look at this theorem uh, due to Derek Thompson and me. So go ahead, why don't you go ahead and read this clear, and I'll make some comments in a moment. Okay, so if C phi is posi-normal, um, then, so the, the range of C phi is contained in the range of adjoint, that could happen because phi is an automorphism, making this an invertible operator. Again, when any invertible operator is posi-normal. Um, it also may be the case, if C phi is posi-normal, phi takes this form, and how should we look at that? Well, I claim, let's look at it this way. Um, basically, C having this form is equivalent to uh, C phi being similar to a normal composition operator. I've got an, this, this composition operator with symbol tau is an invertible composition operator. Tau is the self inverse map. And so um, similarity to a normal composition operator in this context is giving us posi normality. And so what Derek and I actually showed and relied on for some of this is that if you're dealing with linear fractional composition operators, posi-normality is similarity invariant, provided the mapping, the function that induces the similarity is an invertible composition operator, one with an automorphic simple symbol. So that was an uh, important uh, fact for us to use um, in proving this theorem. Uh, another way you get a posi-normal composition operator is to have a fixed point on the boundary with derivative one there. This is a parabolic case. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a, a, a posi-normal composition operator, the symbol is going to have, with a linear fractional symbol, the symbol is going to have to vanish at some point in the disk. So if you have a parabolic mapping um, which vanishes at a point in the disk, it's going to induce a posi-normal composition operator. Another way to get a posi-normal composition operator is to have one fixed point in the disk and one on the boundary. But again, the symbol has to vanish somewhere in the disk. 
And so this final condition, if that fixed point is the origin, and we have a fixed point of the origin on the boundary, we get the hypernormal uh, composition operator. So the hypernormals appear in this first, this fourth bullet point. The normals are up here in the second bullet point. Uh, for coposy normality, it's a bit simpler. Uh, could be invertible. Could have a Dajer Wolf point on the boundary, either uh, hyperbolic or parabolic. Derivative one there, derivative less than one. Um, those will be coposy normal. Can anyone hear me? Normality. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, did, uh, did it stop just for me, by the way? I heard it say recording stopped, and but it said recording back in progress. Uh, no, my, okay, my, my computer actually completely crashed, and I, I couldn't see you guys for like two minutes. I thought that maybe the meeting had over because I was had ended because I was the host. But okay. Oh, I see. I think everything. I yeah. think went okay. So sorry. Um, never mind. No, no problem. Um, so in a positive normality um, uh, with symbol vanishing at the origin for a linear fractional composition operator it turns out to be the same as hypernormality. Um, so I'll say a few words about the proof of this characterization of posi-normality, co-posi-normality for linear fractional composition operators. I've got a posi-normality lemma and a co-posi-normality lemma. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, talk through these. Um, all I'm doing here is just reminding you of what Cowan's adjoint formula for a linear fractional composition operator looks like. Um, so when you're dealing with a linear fractional composition operator, uh, we've got the original symbol phi, and we have the adjoint symbol uh, sigma. And so it turns out that, and these are linear, both linear fractional mappings, and it turns out that posi-normality is essentially equivalent to having this composition turn out to be a self-map. Uh, it's a linear fraction mapping. There's no reason why it should be a self map. Phi is, but sigma inverse, this linear fractional inverse map, who knows what it does. But it turns out that if posi normal, this is a self map. And if it's a self map and phi vanishes at some point in the disk, then C phi is, is posi normal. So we've got this the posi normality condition for this operator theory condition ties in with function theory by this, this composition has to be a self map if you have uh, positive normality. And similarly, if you have co-positive normality, it's even simpler. You don't care about phi vanishing in the disk or not. It's co-positive normal if and only if this composite of linear fractional maps turns out to map the open disk into itself. So the proofs of these lemmas, um, Interesting, um, I wanna show you where this condition B comes from. It's, it's very accessible. Um, so if, if C phi is posi-normal, then the range of C phi star by definition is, well, by my favorite definition contained in the range of, of C phi. But remember the range of C phi star contains reproducing kernels, lots of them. So take your favorite point in the disk. Um, then I've got uh, this point in the range of C phi star, if C phi uh, is uh, co-posi-normal, it has to be in the range of C phi. And if you explore what that means, it basically means that um, this quotient has to uh, extend to be a, a function in the Hardy space. So you're in big trouble if this product turns out to be one, and it turns out to be one at some z in the disk, precisely when this would be non-empty, so we better have it be empty. And so this, this is actually a, a crucial bridge between A and C. I don't wanna get into the, the details of it, um, but that's how this inclusion is playing a role. Let's take a quick look at uh, proof of, of A for the posi-normality lemma. Um, basically, um, 
we'll assume that C phi is posi-normal, range containing the ratio is adjoint. And now I want to, I'm not gonna use reproducing kernels here, but I wanna use uh, Hardy space functions of this form to explore what this inclusion is telling us. I wanna take a, a beta outside the closed disk. So this becomes a bandwidth analog function. It's in the Hardy space. And so uh, F, this F composed with phi is in the range of, of C phi. Um, if that's containing the range of the adjoint, there has to be some other Hardy space function Q. So that uh, adjoint of C phi applied to Q is F uh, circle phi. And let's just try to isolate um, as much as we can um, the Q. I'll divide both sides by G and then uh, formally take the inverse, you know, a sigma is a linear fractional map, take the inverse, do all this formally. And, and basically this function um, has to equal a Hardy space function, it has to extend on to the disk to be a Hardy space function. And so if we um, write out what the left-hand side means, we get that this uh, must be a Hardy space function. Um, and that means we're in trouble. This is basically a linear fractional map here. If we can define all of that, we're in trouble if this linear fractional mapping vanishes at some point in the disk. Um, but vanishing at some point in the disk would be taking on the value beta outside the disk. So for this to be a Hardy space function, this composite phi composed with sigma inverse better not hit any point outside the disk. So that composite should be taking points in the open disk to points in the closed disk. But assuming it's not a constant map, it's an open mapping, it has to take the disk into itself. So that's a rough uh, outline of the proof of A. And quickly, the proof of B, if you assume that this is a self map, we've got a composition operator that can help us write the original composition operator as C phi star times T, where T has this form. And either by Rayleigh's theorem or just by, you know, if this is true, the range of C phi is contained in the range of C phi star, um, that's the, how the proof of B goes. All right, so the rest of the characterization theorem of quasi-normality is just a matter of looking at the fixed point cases and determining when phi composed with sigma inverse will be a self map, when sigma composed with phi inverse will be a self map. And so uh, Derek and I just took this case by case, let's throw out the automorphisms, they're not interesting because C phi will be invertible and quasi normal automatically. So in the hyperbolic case, um, the basic what happens is that this composite is never gonna be a self map. Again, we're throwing out automorphisms. Um, so we're never going to have posi-normality, but we'll always have co-posi-normality. Uh, the most interesting case, uh, I think from a general perspective, is the parabolic case. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, you get both posi and co-posi-normality. Um, both this uh, self-map and, and, and sigma composes phi inverses are self-maps. And so if, if phi also vanishes at a point in the disk, we get both posi-normality and co-posi-normality. Um, so this was especially interesting because when Derek and I started our, our work, we certainly had some other references about posi-normal operators on helper spaces. And one of the papers said that if you take a gener generic posi-normal operator T, which is also co-posi-normal, then all powers will be posi-normal, um, sort of behaving in the way a normal operator would. Um, but here's a counterexample. So it's a counterexample because basically um, when you take powers of a composition operator, you get a new composition operator, but the nth power will be the composition operator um, whose symbol will be the nth iterate of the original symbol. And so if you start, let me try to draw a picture here, um, wish me luck. So if you start with a parabolic mapping with a uh, Dondra Wolf point here, what will the range of C look like that's parabolic? Well, it's linear fractional. It's going to be uh, a disk will be the range, it takes the unit circle to another circle, but it's going to be an internally tangent subdisk. And so if I uh, choose my mapping properly, I can make that disk include one. And now I'm looking at the image of a phi 
parabolic um, that induces a positive normal composition operator. But as I iterate phi, what's going to happen? Uh, that that disk for P2 is going to shrink. So higher and higher iterates, that inner tangent disk is going to shrink toward the non dual point. Eventually, you're not going to vent, phi is not going to vanish at some point. So for parabolic mappings, non-anomorphic mappings, um, you can start with phi vanishing at a point, but some power will be a composition operator whose symbol is still parabolic, but won't vanish. So powers of posi-normal operators need not be posi-normal, um, even if the operator happens to be co-posi-normal. So more about that in a second. Um, dilation case, um, interior and boundary fixed point. Uh, we always get uh, posi-normality. Um, this is the, um, includes the hypernormals. The dilation case was the most difficult case, interior and exterior fixed points. Um, this is where we sort of had to develop um, similarity and variance for posi-normality of linear fractional uh, composition operators, um, as long as the similarity is, is induced by an invertible composition operator. Um, I think I'm now ready to uh, conclude the talk with the discussion of, of powers of posi-normal operators. When will they be posi-normal? Um, we have this example of uh, a parabolic, and you know, more generally, one of the product of two posi-normals be posi-normal. Um, so we have this example of these parabolic non-automorphic um, composition operators whose powers uh, will be, that can be posi-normal, which have non-posi-normal powers. One thing about these, all these linear fractional um, composition operators, as long as the symbol is, is not constant, these will have dense range, uh, but not be surjective. They won't have closed range. And so this is one of the reasons why uh, Derek and I conjectured that if you throw in closed range, then uh, powers of a closed range posi-normal operator will turn out to be uh, posi-normal and the powers will continue to have closed range. So uh, in general, powers of closed range operators do not have to have closed range. I actually had to work a while to come up with an example. And so I'll challenge you to come up with a, a nice example of a closed range Hilbert space operator who has, has a who square say it doesn't have closed range, um, but I'm, I'm not gonna go further into that. I wanna say a few words about the descent of an operator. Um, so it's, it's obvious that the range of T to the K plus one power is certainly contained in the range of T to the K. So uh, the sequence of ranges of powers of the Hiller space operator is a decreasing sequence. If it strictly decreases, uh, we have an operator that has infinite descent. Um, it, otherwise, um, it's going to decrease to a certain point and stabilize. The point of stabilization is called the descent of the operator. Um, this is a fairly, uh, I guess, well-known notion. Um, it's, I'll be using the fact that if an operator has descent K, you get stability beyond that point. That is, um, if, if the range of T to the K is the range of T to the K plus one, then the, the range of t to the n is always going to be t to the k for n bigger than equal to k. Uh, this is actually just basically based on the definition of range. You don't have to uh, use induction, but I'm running out of time. So uh, you can just accept that. And I'll go ahead and finish up by proving this proposition p. Um, the proof I'm going to show you is not the original proof that Derek, Carlos, and I um, came up with. A couple of months ago, we posted a paper on the archive that uh, had this proposition as one of its results. A couple of weeks later, Trey Love from uh, University of Toledo wrote and said, have you thought about basically products of uh, posi-normal operators? And he had a nice theorem about products, which actually yields this as a corollary. And we've been working on this question of when products of posi-normals will be posi-normal. And one of our product theorems, when you take its argument and reduce it to this case, um, you're, you're about to see what that looks like. And it's, it's very pleasant. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and present that here. Um, so let's suppose um, T is posi-normal on H with closed range. 
um, I want to try to convince you that all powers of T will be posi-normal. So let's uh, begin by thinking about the range of T star. Uh, first of all, uh, T having closed range certainly tells us the adjoint has closed range. Um, the range of T star will be the direct image of H under T star. We can decompose H into orthogonal direct sum here, kernel T star perp of the kernel, which is the closure of the range, but that's the range here, so I'm assuming the range is closed. So the range of, of T star is a direct image of the range of T under T star. Now I'm assuming posi-normality. And so the range of T is contained in the range of T star. And so I get a potentially bigger direct image here. Um, and then by definition, this is the, the range of T star squared. And so I've proved that if T is positive normal with closed range, then the range of T star has descent one. The range of T star is the range of T star squared. And that means that the range of all powers of T star is gonna, they're gonna be the same as the range of T star, but the range of T star is closed. Um, and so I get the range of all powers of T star is, are closed. So that means the range of all powers of T will be closed. So what's left is to show that uh, Tn will be posi-normal for any positive integer n. And that's actually very easy using this first paragraph as a lemma. Take your favorite positive integer. Obviously the range of Tn is contained in the range of T. I am assuming that T is posi-normal. So the range of T is contained in the range of T star. But I just showed that's the same as the range of uh, the nth power of T star, which is the nth power of T star. And so I've just proved the range of, of this operator um, is contained in the, the range of its adjoint. And so I've just proved the, the T to the N is posi-normal for all N. Um, and this is the product theorem or proposition. Um, it was sort of proving this proposition that led to uh, this, what I think is very nice proof that powers of closed range posi-normal operators will have closed range. Um, and I think I'll just stop there. I think the, yeah, I think it's maybe a little before five. Um, um, but anyway, happy to take questions or um, talk about life in Charlottesville. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you, Paul. Uh, sure, do we have any questions? I have some questions, but I think maybe I should look at the papers. How many how many papers are there right now? They're just so there's the the first paper on composition operators uh, on the archive, and the second paper was on uh, powers basically of posi-normal operators, and that paper is in the process of sort of expanding to uh, products of posi-normals. Um, so we've um, made a uh, a lot of progress with products. So that, that paper on powers is not going to be published. It's basically gonna be replaced with one on products. And we have at this point, or I guess our most exciting uh, product theorem is that we have characterized when the product of two posi-normal matrices will be posi-normal. Um, and uh, the, there are some generalizations to uh, infinite dimensions, um, but there's there's one more result we want to get uh, before we sort of um, post a sort of replacement paper with uh, products being the focus rather than powers. If it's a matrix, then posi normal is the same as coposi normal. Yes, exactly. And so that's, and that's the same why thing as being an EP matrix, right? That's a standard topic in matrix theory. It means oh, cool. you direct sum to a. You're unitarily equivalent to invertible plus zero. Right, so, right. Um, it's called an EP matrix. That's one thing people call it. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's exactly um, that uh, working in the matrix world where, you know, coposinormal and uh, posinormal are the same. That's what our, our characterization of, of, of quasi-normal products uh, depends on. 
And so um, possibly you're saying that with this sort of alternative uh, terminology, uh, it, it might be already known, I guess, what the, you know, when products of posi-normal matrices will be posi-normal. For matrices, I think I think there is some literature about that. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. That'll, that'll be that'll be helpful. Yeah. So EP matrices is one thing to look under. Any um, other uh, sort of terminology I should be aware of? People might be using in the. We can uh, email or something. Right now we're being recorded. I don't want to say something too stupid. Okay. Sure. 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 Yeah. Sorry. I, 